Good morning. Hello. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Um, there's just a few people coming in as, as, as we speak. So welcome. My name is Chris uh, Woodfield, and I'll be hosting this morning. So yeah, I really appreciate you coming this morning. I'm really excited to have you here. So I could just see a few more people coming in. But as you're coming in and getting settled, I've just got a question up on the screen. And I'd really love for you to, to precipitate in this, this little exercise to get us started. So if you go on the following link, which is in the chat. Um, so if those, those of you are just coming in, there should be a link in the chat. And there's a question there. And I'd love for you to just have a think about that question and just put down a couple of words to describe the type of Devon you'd like to live in in 2025. So just as people are arriving, getting settled. If you could do that, that'd be great. Welcome to those who've just arrived. Good morning. It's great to have you here. Can see there's a few more people coming in. There's a website. There's a website. Do we have to get on that to answer the questions? No. Yeah, yeah. That that's correct. My um, colleague Haley's just put the link in the chat. So it's www.menti.com. Yep. You can follow that link and then use the code, or you can okay. click click on the link which is directly in in the chat. The chat okay. function. Let's try that. Is that working? Okay. So yeah, the link is also in the chat if you can use that. It's just a little exercise to get us started. Um, and then we'll dive straight in. So for those of you who've just arrived, uh, my name's Chris and I'm part of the Low Carbon Devon team and I'm really excited to, to have you here. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction and then we'll dive straight in. So I'm part of the Low Carbon Devon team and all of the other Low Carbon Devon team members have just changed their name in the, not, not in real life, but in the Zoom call. Um, so you can just see LCD. So if you look through the precipitants, you can see LCD Chris, LCD Claire, Haley, and that's the low carbon Devon team, just to give you an idea of who we are. So I just thought I'd mention that. And as well, we are recording this event because we, we'd love to share it with you afterwards and we'd love to share it with people who, who, could, who couldn't make it this morning. So just to let you know that as well. And also... If you don't want to be recorded, you could turn your camera off. Um, that's one way of around that. But we'd really love to have your cameras on because we'd really love to see you and have that sort of face-to-face -face interaction. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, we can't be together. But um, if you could keep those cameras on, it'd be great to have that visual connection. That would be great. And also, I'd just like to say thank you for coming this morning. We're really excited for you to be here. And another thing, if, you, if you'd like to, I'd just like to invite people to just put their name and what organisation they're from in the chat, just to give people a feel and a flavour of who we've got in the room. So if you'd like to put your name or your job title or your organisation in the chat, then please do do that. Um, it'd be great for everyone to see who's here. So yeah, that'd be awesome if you could do that. And it's great to see some familiar faces as well as some new ones as well. So as I said, my name's Chris and we're really excited to have uh, Emily here today with us. Emily Reed from the, the Devon Climate Emergency Team and the Devon Carbon Plan. So she's just going to give an overview in a, in a minute or so of the Devon Carbon Plan. And then I'm going to give an overview of low carbon Devon. And then my colleagues on the call are going to delve into their areas and then we're going to have an opportunity to go into breakout rooms and have some discussion whilst also I'm going to sum up and summarize some next steps. 
but I'd just like to highlight one of my colleagues, Hayley, who will be organising stuff in the background. Hayley, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, I was waving, but I appreciate not everyone can see me. So, hello. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Hayley. So, Hayley will be there if, if any technical difficulties occur, and she'll also be organising the breakout rooms later. But without further ado, I'd love to introduce Emily, uh, Emily Reid from Devon County Council, and she's going to be talking about the Devon Carbon Plan. Thank you, Chris. I'll just share my screen. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Has that shared? Not yet. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it has. Brilliant. Fantastic. Um, Sorry, I'm having a uh, a technical moment, which is strange considering that I've spent most of the week on Zoom. Um, <laughs> oh dear, I've lost my window. What have I done with it? So the Devon Carbon Plan has been launched this week, so Emily's been doing quite a lot of webinars around this so we're very grateful to for you to spend some time with us this morning thank oh. you um i've clearly got zoom fatigue because um uh, there's some human error creeping in here uh why is it minimized um do you want us to um i, I can see the slides okay i'm not sure <laughs> I can't, but um, I don't know why that is. What have I done? Sorry, this is a bit tedious. Um, mm, mm, mm. Right. Maybe stop sharing and share again, maybe. Ah, right. I found my window. Sorry. That should, that should work. Um, sorry about that. Um, right, so I'm Emily Reid, I'm from um, Devon Climate Emergency uh, and I'm the project manager for the, the partnership. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about, about the, the partnership and how the plan's been produced and opportunities for you to engage in the consultation. Uh, so hopefully my slides are moving now. Does that, does that look like they're moving? Great. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, as I said, uh, tell you a bit about the partnership and uh, tell you how you can get engaged. So the overarching uh, goal of the partnership is to create a resilient net zero carbon Devon where people and nature thrive um, and one of our partners is Plymouth University so um, we're really excited to work closely with Low Carbon Devon. So uh, some of the ways that we're going to reach this are um, uh, to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2050 at the latest. Um, so that uh, means that we need to balance any continuing emissions of greenhouse gases with um, drawing down greenhouse gases from the uh, uh, atmosphere through things like tree planting uh, and improve the resilience of Devon's environment because we know that we are going to see greater climate change we're locked into a certain amount of it um, so our landscapes need to be able to cope with things like increased rainfall and so do our communities so we've got to prepare communities for a warmer world so that they're uh, ready for things like flooding you can see the logos of the partnerships on the right there and um, so all of the local authorities in Devon including Plymouth and Torbay um, as well as uh, environmental organisations such as the Wildlife Trust and emergency response organisations as well as um, private um, companies such as uh, Western Power Distribution and South Earth Water. The partnership has declared a climate emergency and produced um, commitments as part of the declaration so the partners are committed to uh, lobby government for the required national policy changes and resources so that we can get on with it in Devon uh, to review their own organisational carbon emissions uh, so that they uh, meet their their climate responsibilities in line with with what the UN globally is saying we need to do and to collaborate to produce and implement the Devon Carbon Plan as well as uh, reviewing the risks 
uh, to communities from a warmer world. Um, and I should say, actually, we would love for other organisations to sign up to the declaration. So please do consider it for your organisation and you can do so on the website. The um, partnership is uh, managed at a strategic level um, by the response group. So uh, the partner organisations, um, uh, the directors and CEO level staff sit on the response group. And then the tactical group is a, is a sort of... Um, uh, an update group where staff can share learnings about um, what they're doing in their own organisations and contribute um, to refining the, the work of the partnership. And then there's two work streams, the emissions reduction, so the mitigation work stream that is led by a uh, net zero task force, uh, which is 15 expert volunteers uh, from, from Devon's universities, including Plymouth, um, as well as uh, lots of different expertise, for example, waste, energy. Uh, and they've contributed to um, shaping the interim Devon Carbon Plan, as well as the adaptation work stream, which is um, led by the Environment Agency uh, and is working with Devon Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly to produce a uh, adaptation plan. So there was an evidence gathering phase where uh, we had almost 900 submissions uh, from the public uh, with suggestions for what ought to be in the Devon Carbon Plan. We also met with the Youth Parliament. I think there's 15 schools attended that uh, and had a series of thematic hearings, uh, for example, around built environment or uh, food, land and sea, uh, where various expertise was brought together to advise. So the plan is a plan for everyone in Devon. And uh, so we've gathered together this, this evidence and we've put it into the draft interim Devon Carbon Plan. Why is it an interim plan? Uh, well, we had hoped to hold the Citizens Assembly by now, but the pandemic got in the way. Uh, so we've gone ahead and published the plan and um, signposted in the plan the issues that we haven't given actions uh, for, but we uh, think ought to be um, uh, dis uh, discussed by the Citizens Assembly because um, they need further deliberation but the majority of the issues we have actually specified recommended, recommended actions for. Uh, so we'll update the plan with um, informed by the Citizens Assembly uh, at the end of next year. So uh, the plan describes what we need to do to reach net zero uh, and a trajectory to meet net zero by 2050, uh, but it does give the option for these actions to be done sooner um, so that we can meet uh, net zero before 2050. And that's a point for consultation that we would like your input on. It indicates the costs, the opportunities and the, and the co-benefits of doing that. Um, so please do read the description of the challenges for reaching net zero um, before 2050, such as the fact that um, the national timetable uh, is 2050 and um, if we uh, adopt a date that's earlier, then we're likely to um, uh, have higher costs and also be in competition with other parts of the UK that are uh, tr trying to reach it by 2050. So yeah, do, do respond to that consultation question and let us know what you think. So we're clear that um, we need additional funding and resources to deliver this plan. We haven't secured those already, um, but we do describe uh, next to each action where we think the money may come from if we know of a funding stream uh, and how much resources we think it needs broadly, not a, not a specific level, but whether it can be done with any existing resources or not. Um, there are significant opportunities for organisations uh, both private and community investment. Uh, there are things that, that are likely to be profit making. Uh, and um, so it's worth having a look through that and uh, seeing if you get some inspiration there. Um, we recognise that Devon is a very rural county. We do have three major urban areas, uh, but the, the way that communities achieve net zero and their contribution will differ depending on where they are in Devon. And some things will be more challenging for example, um, stopping car use uh, in some of our remoter parts of Devon is, is more challenging. Uh, so electric vehicles will have more of a role there. 
there are lots of benefits to achieving net zero. So um, from health and wellbeing, prosperity and the environment, um, reducing fuel poverty through insulating buildings um, will, <coughs> will benefit many people across Devon, uh, as will more active lifestyles and healthier diets. Uh, and this will put less strain on the NHS. Uh, there'll be new jobs and skills um, and um, improving our energy security will also contribute to local economic prosperity. As I said, we need to make the landscape more resilient and that will help uh, reverse the decline of biodiversity and improve water and air quality at the same time, for example, by restoring our peat bogs on Dartmoor and Exmoor. So um, we'd love you to go on the website and um, participate in the consultation that is in an executive summary if you don't have time to dig into the whole document. So uh, do at least take a look at that. Uh, and um, then also attend some of our thematic webinars to align with your particular interests. So they're coming up and there's more information on our website. And do follow us on various channels where we're um, communicating. So uh, check us out on social media, um, including LinkedIn and on the website. Great. So hopefully I haven't run over time too badly and uh, there's a bit of time for questions. I think I may have. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Emily. Um, maybe, I think what we'll do is keep, keep the flow moving. Uh, maybe people could put their question, if they have, do have questions specifically for you, maybe put them in the chat or to email Emily directly. Um, the slides will be shared as well. So, so myself, Emily, and all the other speakers will be sharing the slides afterwards as well as the recording. Um, but no, that's great. It's, it's an amazing opportunity and it's really great to see the Devon Carbon Plan happening. And it's really great opportunity for people to engage as well. So I'd really encourage you to make the most of that. Um, so really appreciate Really appreciate it, Emily. It's great to hear. I'm grateful for you coming today, especially with such a busy week. So do go to some of those webinars that are coming up. Um, I've been to a few already, and they're a really great opportunity to hear what's happening. But moving on, uh, um, I'm just going to outline what that is and, and how you can get involved. Uh, but first of all, I just would like to share the results from the question that I asked at the start. So it's great to see, hope, hope everyone can see that. Maybe just a thumbs up if you can. Um, so some words that are used to describe the type of Devon we'd like to see in 2025. So it's really heartening. So we've got green, clean, sustainable. Lots of great stuff there, collaborative. So let's try and use that energy to, to sort of drive us forward. And I can share this afterwards as well. Um, so that's really great. Thank you for precipitating in that. What I'm going to do now is just, like I said, give you an overview of Low Carbon Devon and how you can get involved. Um, so the Low Carbon Devon project is just one of many projects within the Sustainable Earth Institute here at the University of Plymouth. And it's funded by the ERDF, so the European Regional Development Fund. And I'm just going to give you an overview of what that is. And also delve into a bit more detail around the knowledge exchange element. So it's an exciting new catalyst for low carbon economic growth in Devon. It's focused on directly engaging with SMEs, so small and medium sized enterprises. Focused around tackling climate change, but in a solutions focused and practical action focused way. And it's running until early 2023. So one of the reasons why I asked that question is because by the end of this project, we'll be more than halfway to 2025. And myself and the team here are really excited about sort of rising to that challenge and trying to make that happen um, and using those types of words that you've described. So thank you for that. And the project has got four main elements and I'm just going to run through these in turn. <clears throat> so the first part of the project then is the sustainability hub itself. So some of you might have been to this the hub on the University of Plymouth campus. It's a beautiful building. 
It's really a collaborative and partnership space for local organisations, students, academics, enterprises to come together to use and to utilise on campus. So we, we'd really love to, to hopefully welcome you there uh, sometime in the near future. The second part of the project is around how can we implement these carbon reduction measures across the university. So not just this one building, but looking at other low carbon measures such as LED lighting in other university buildings as well. And then the research and innovation aspect, which my colleagues will, will talk about shortly, um, <laughs> is focused on using the sustainability hub as a living lab and testing ground. So it's around carrying out research but also exploring how we can implement those low carbon solutions within local organizations such as yourselves. So my colleagues will expand on their areas shortly. And then the knowledge exchange aspect. So that's my, my particular focus and that's around a series of knowledge exchange events. And myself and the team are really excited. We're planning the delivery of these events at the moment. And these events are to highlight the benefits and opportunities of moving towards a low carbon economy, whilst also aiming to inspire and drive positive change. And they're also an opportunity to co-create. So we're really keen to hear from you and then to be demand led. So if you'd like to see a particular event theme or an event on a particular area, we'd love to explore that with you. Um, hence why I asked that question on the registration form and thank you for those who precipitated in that so we highlighted some event suggestions and it's really great to see that that a lot of you would like to see events around these particular themes um, so that's really great so myself and the team will reflect on that and if you have other ideas as well uh, we, we, we'd, we'd really love to hear from you and if you'd like to collaborate on the delivery of those events we're, we're really keen on that as well. So collaboration is a real key part of this project. And then moving on to the internship program then. So this is a really exciting and unique opportunity. So it's a one to three month work placement, placing current students or recent graduates within your organizations. And it's fully funded by the project. And alongside this practical work experience, will be implementing a series of personal development and change leadership workshops. So these are weekly or bi-weekly workshops that aim to upskill the interns. And this is very much focused on the what, the why and the how. So through their practical work experience with you, they'll be exploring what needs to change, but we'll also be looking at how do we solve problems creatively and what does it mean to be a good leader? So this is some of the things that will come into these workshops. And they will be based around something called the Plymouth Compass. So these workshops will be focused on a particular point of the compass. And they'll be exploring things like impact strategy, design thinking, facilitation and listening skills, things that they can practically apply within your organization, for example. So wouldn't it be amazing if all of our students left university with these future facing attributes? They'll also be exploring things like the circular economy and donor economics, the planetary boundaries, and also things like the sustainable development goals, but not just what they are, but how can we implement them locally and how can we take action on them in a solutions focused way here in Devon. So just to sum up the internship program then, it's really an exciting space for the interns to develop their own passions and employability skills whilst helping you on a real life practical project. And we're looking for this to take place in a series of cohorts. So if, if you're keen to be part of that first cohort in February, then please do get in touch with me. Um, there's still time to make that happen. And then it will be run throughout the year and then the following year after that. And it's really a practical solutions focused action combined with this leadership development. So I'm actively looking for Devon-based enterprises at the moment. So if you've got a project idea that you think an intern could do, or if you've got an idea and you'd like to develop that idea, then I'd really love to hear from you. Because as I said, this is a really unique and exciting opportunity. So I'm really keen to, 
to see what we can do to place some interns to really be of value to your local organization. So to sum up as a whole then, so I've just given you a brief outline of what the Low Carbon Demo Project is and then homed in on the events and the, the internship opportunity. So if you'd like to know more and you'd like to have a, a discussion about next steps, then please do get in touch. Um, I'll be at the end of the event, sort of summarizing and highlighting some next steps. But for now, I'll, I'll hand back to, to Haley, my colleague, who will introduce the first of our industrial research fellows. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for that really interesting overview to the project. Um, and now, just to speed things along nicely, I'm going to introduce Emma, who is our Creative Industries Industrial Research Fellow. So, Emma, if you'd like to share your presentation with everyone. Thanks, Emma. Thank you, Haley. So I'm Emma Whitaker, the Creative Industries Research Fellow for the Low Carbon Devon Project. And in this area of the Low Carbon Devon Project, we're going to be investigating how um, the creative industries are working with low carbon. And what are the low carbon practices, processes, products or services produced by the creative industries? And of course, the creative industries is a really large area. So um, the kind of responses to low carbon agenda will be quite different in those different areas. But just to give you a flavour, if we can look at briefly a case study from theatre. So if we think about, first of all, um, energy, we could ask questions like, is the power sourced from green energy suppliers? Is LED lighting used? Is the building sufficiently insulated? perhaps using a green wall or roof garden? Is the organisation taking part in tree planting schemes for carbon offsetting? In the cafe or restaurant, are the ingredients locally sourced from producers that don't use pesticides and have high welfare standards? And waste, is single use crockery and plastic minimised? Is food waste reduced and scraps composted or processed in wormeries? Is rubbish sorted and recycled? Are sustainable cleaning products and recycled toilet paper used? And travel, are audiences actively encouraged to travel by sustainable means? And are performance times coordinated with public transport timetables? And of course, theatre uses a lot of materials, so are sets designed to be modular or for materials to be reused and repurposed? is salvage and set exchange utilised? And are materials from sustainable sources that use clean energy? And have those supply chains been investigated? And in the creative practice itself, do the creative practices directly explore the low carbon agenda and what is the potential for this? Or perhaps these issues are integrated within other narratives? So we can see in this case study, there are lots of areas which cross over with the other research fellows, which um, of course can be explored there as well. So the, the questions that this project is asking are, what are the narratives of low carbon? For example, how is climate change framed and explained? And what accounts are individuals, communities and enterprises telling about their own activities and that of others? And what are our visions for a future low carbon world? And how are the creative industries, specifically within Devon, engaging with the low carbon agenda? So if we have a look at some um, specific businesses and organisations within Devon, the Precious Plastics, Tavistock and Plymouth, for example, are engaging with the circular economy by recycling plastic, melting it down, enabling designers to create new objects and for children and families to learn about sustainable living. And Art.Earth, a Devon-based transdisciplinary arts organisation with an international outlook that brings creatives together around ecological thinking, sustainability and low carbon. It, in its publishing wing, their current book Honey Money 
New Money for a New Society, looks at the use of bodily waste to create energy from the perspectives of art, science, engineering, and politics. And Tidelines is a creative organization that supports community participation, research and action in response to the changing environment. And they're currently working in the ex estuary and coastline. And Photo Now, a Plymouth-based media social enterprise specializing in community-focused photographic and film projects, many of which involve climate-related issues, such as the youth response in Plymouth to the climate emergency. So how can we support you? So the Low Carbon Project can support creative industries through research. Research to develop, design or innovate a practice, process, product or service that engages with the low carbon agenda. And engagement, opportunities to network at our free events, workshops, symposia, for example, to learn about how to reduce your carbon emissions. Or perhaps you'd like your enterprise to feature on an online map with creative industries that are engaging with the low carbon agenda. Or would you like to be involved in creating narratives of low carbon or future visions of a low carbon world? And here I'll leave you with a quote from Paolo Coelho the alchemist. Here I am, between my flock and my treasure, the boy thought. He had to choose between something he had become accustomed to and something he wanted to have. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Emma, for these inspirational examples and ways in which enterprises can engage with the creative industries element of the Low Carbon Devon Project. Um, I would now like to introduce everyone to Thomas Murphy. He is our Green Walls Industrial Research Fellow. So Tom, if you'd like to uh, share your screen. Brilliant, thank you. Oh, I need to unmute myself. Apologies, everybody. <laughs> Less smooth, I thought. Can you reshare again? Yeah, I'm just doing that. There we are. Yeah, yeah. so good morning, everybody. Um, so I'd like to introduce myself. So my name is Thomas Murphy, um, and I'm the Green Walls Industrial Research Fellow uh, for the Low Carbon Devon Project. Um, so my speciality um, is really plant-soil interaction. So I'm a plant-soil scientist. Um, we have a real particular focus on looking at nature-based solutions to climate change um, and, the, and the low carbon agenda. So my role has two sort of main focuses. So the first one is looking at research, so looking at optimising green walls um, within Devon and more widely. So how can we use research to do that? Second aspect is, is supporting Devon-based SMEs, as, as Chris and, and Emma have outlined. Um, but that's really looking at the technical and academic expertise to, to take advantage of the growing opportunities that are, are there within the green wall sector, um, and they are growing. So those of you, um, there'll be those of you who have a quite a good idea of green walls, some less so, um, but we know that they're associated with multiple benefits. Um, so these, particularly air quality at the moment. So with COVID nineteen, I think we're all quite aware of our our environment, um, particularly in urban areas. I think that's a real factor, and we know that green walls are associated with a sixty percent reduction in particulate matter. matter. Um, there's also the mental health and physical health benefits. So um, we know there's a significant reduction in, in stress um, and actually reductions in cortisol levels in, um, in people that's been shown. Um, so it can make a real difference to a, a well-being economy going into the future. There's also the aesthetic value. So the picture on, your, on the right of the screen is a, is a fantastic room all in um, Madrid. So this is designed by Patrick Blanc and um, green walls can make a fantastic uh, focal point in cities um, really sort of really sort of standing out in, in these urban environments and there's also the reduced water runoff so uh, Emily talked about uh, big challenges with with climate change and increased rainfall 
Um, we know that green walls can help in, in reducing water runoff, so they can make a big difference in sustainable urban drainage. There's also the wildlife and biodiversity benefits. So um, we know birds and pollinators use it for forage and shelter. Um, so it's particularly valuable in, in quite, um, to make those connections in, in cities. There's also the urban heat island effect. So with climate change, our, our urban areas in particular are going to get getting warmer. Um, and having greenery and green urban spaces can help uh, reduce that. And importantly, very importantly for low carbon Devon is that building energy savings possible. And that's really, really important because buildings directly account for around 17% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and 60% of this is simply through heating of our buildings. Um, and interestingly, so initial research, which has been conducting on the sustainability hub in University of Plymouth and the, the lovely building we've got, suggests the green wall uh, re resulted in a 31% uh, improvement in insulation over the original masonry wall. Um, so that's comparable to cavity fill insulation. So that's really uh, quite remarkable. However, there's limited information on the most appropriate plant species to use to maximise all the benefits that we talked about and reduce some of the disbenefits such as water and nutrient use. So some of the research I'll be taking will be undertaking will be looking at um, optimising plant choice, growth medium of living wall systems to maximise those CO2 savings possible and all the other multiple benefits and really to demonstrate that green walls are a viable, potentially, uh, potentially viable and cost effective option for building retrofit and construction sectors in both commercial and domestic settings. So uh, I suppose what can we offer you? Um, so we're looking to, hold, uh, to offer free research support and collaboration so we could potentially work together to evidence the benefits of existing um, or future application of green walls. Um, we could develop or refine a new product or service around green walls, such as looking at plant choice, growth medium, um, water and nutrient systems, also maintenance operations and processes. Also, we could perhaps design and test new green wall systems. Um, so as well as the research, there's also events that we'll be, be holding, um, workshops. And these will include looking at the multiple benefits of green walls for urban planning, um, optimising that plant choice and design to maximise their benefits, and also looking at the practical requirements and opportunities within the green walls uh, maintenance sector. Um, so, yeah, so if you're interested in, in being involved and haven't um, already uh, signed out the expression of interest form, please do. So I've put the link on, on the presentation. Um, and yeah, feel free to get in contact with me. I mean, that's really what today's about. Um, please, um, yeah, if you're interested to discuss further, just, yeah, please get in contact um, and you can follow the link on the presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Tom, Stop for this sharing. fascinating insight into the impact of green walls and how you hope to work with enterprises going forward. I will now hand over to Sepade Korsavi, who will tell you more about her area, uh, which is the energy efficient buildings and occupant behaviour. Thank you, Sepade. Thanks, Haley. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, my name is Sepide, and I work as a research fellow on energy efficiency in buildings and the role of occupants' adaptive behaviours. Um, so we all know that occupants' behavior is the leading source of uncertainty in accurately predicting the energy performance of the building and indoor environment quality. Um, so it is very significant to understand, define, monitor, and estimate occupants' behavior and its role on energy consumption. Um, it is also related to building-related factors and indoor environment quality, but specifically we work on its uh, relation with energy consumption and energy uh, optimization in this uh, project. So the main aim of the project is to develop smartphone uh, tablet apps to facilitate occupants' efficient adaptive behaviors and to provide energy feedbacks, save energy, and to improve indoor environment quality. For that, there are several objectives defined. We need to develop and optimize occupants' behavioral models, and we need to implement and optimize uh, buildings' energy management systems. Also, we need to manage peak loads, adjust cooling and heating temperature set points, and conduct energy audit and post-occupancy evaluation. 
So the features of smart applications um, are energy saving points uh, and recommendation, customized feedback, visualized uh, user interface and attention triggers. You can see one example in this slide that how, how all these features can be shown in the app. Uh, the energy feedbacks are a very good way to turn a resource that is invisible for the occupants to energy consumers into a visible resource. And also it turns energy consumers from passive state to an active state while they can help to save energy. And also direct feedbacks are effective in sim stimulating occupants to change their energy consumption. So um, the use of feedback systems can help us gain an insight into energy consumption, change occupants' behavior, and also change energy consumption. For the uh, apps, the design really helps uh, to provide low uh, cost and simple design for uh, making energy feedback available. It also encourages to monitor consumption and guides for taking action to save energy. Uh, also, it improves uh, communication that can lead to prompt action for building energy reduction. We can see an example of the app design in which uh, the current consumption of electricity and gas uh, during different periods of time can be um, seen and observed in the app. Uh, the methods that are used for uh, designing app can be um, recording energy consumption and occupants uh, interaction with controls. So for occupancy and occupant behavior, we can use cameras or passive infrared. Also for indoor and outdoor environmental conditions, we can use wireless sensor network or weather uh, um, statistics stations. Uh, we can also, uh, for energy consumption and usage pattern, we can use electricity and gas meters. So um, the real time and projected featured uh, energy consumption uh, can be obtained based on occupants adaptive behaviors in a way that we can change raw data on energy behavior into something that is very understandable and easy for the occupants. This is another example of the app design in which goals, impacts and comfort um, has been defined. It really helps to uh, see visually the uh, financial and the environmental impacts that the app can have. Um, there is also another example where we can see secure login energy consumption uh, of plug loads and occupancy patterns and also indoor environmental conditions uh, of the space. So we are looking for organizations or enterprises who want to use their energy building data to reduce energy consumption or they have concerns about their energy bills uh, and they think that um, with efficient adaptive behaviors, this can be reduced. And also they have a desire to develop digital software or tools and want to visualize their energy consumption and develop useful feedback tools. And um, so if you are interested, please get uh, in touch with us uh, and we can further discuss this. Thank you so much for listening. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sefde, for telling us all more about your ideas for the app development and who you are hoping to work with. Uh, so now we welcome uh, Johnny Bloor, who doesn't officially start for another month or so, but we are very fortunate to have him here today um, and he will be discussing power electronics. On loan. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Hayley. Thank you all. Just share my screen. Everyone can see that OK? Great. Okay, well, first I'd like to give you all another warm welcome to uh, this first of, of many low carbon Devon events from the Sustainability Hub at the University of Plymouth. It's a, it's a collaborative space um, with these beautiful green walls, um, building management system, this living lab, and it's just a great initiative to be a part of. Um, and so the low carbon Devon project is going to be supporting Devon enterprises, as you've heard, to shift to low carbon to a low carbon economy. So, so who am I? Well, my role hasn't begun yet. Uh, starts the February the 1st, but I'll be in this research collaboration. I'll be the Power Le Electronics Research Fellow. Um, and I've got an uh, interdisciplinary background of research. Um, I did a master's in, in robotics at Plymouth University. I've worked in the graphene lab, developing graphene field effect transistors. 
uh, have done had some solar power installation experience in my younger days so climbing up on roofs so I, I can make that connection between research and in industry quite well and so we're you know we're here to help SMEs develop a new low carbon technology uh, either that, whether that be a battery charger or some sort of conversion electronics power efficiency um, so we're looking to save carbon and save energy through um, saving electricity effectively so um, it'd be great to have some sort of research collaborations on board and I've got a particular interest in low carbon transport as well so electric vehicles or personal light electric vehicles uh, are, are sort of uh, in my ballpark so but but you know a kind of a research collaboration is what we're looking for in the power electronics sector so when we talk about what the what the power electronics team is currently doing um, that we often talk about power efficiency verification and things like this which effectively is you know in a low carbon technology electrically you always have conversions from alternating current to direct current whether you're charging your phone your laptop or you've got beautiful solar panels on your roof and, you, and, you, and you're going from a DC supply to an AC to connect to the grid. Now in these conversions, there's always losses. And so we're interested in reducing losses in reducing and, and, and reducing the losses reduces carbon and saves you money. So, and we talked about LED lighting in the university. I mean, if, if you think about all of those drivers in every single light, the thousands of lights, and if they're working inefficiently within the university, then you know you're, you're you're wasting a lot of money but also you're producing a lot of carbon unnecessarily so so we're able to to, to sort of benchmark these things um we're interested in mechanical efficiency for electric motors um up to 20 percent of your battery if you have an electric car is lost in conversion into the electric motor so it's 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 a really large part of, of reducing carbon um so the team are also benchmarking characteristics in these devices. If you're developing, say, a new product, they're able to understand and simultaneously model waveforms in terms of current or voltage or electrical angle, et cetera, and mechanical power. So we're, you know, we're already working on things. Well, the team is, uh, which I yet to join. And, um, but we also have other, I have research interests in understanding DC power storage connected to renewable systems, how that's going to feed into charging points for cars across Devon and general grid connectivity. Are we going to develop local power for local people? Are we going to try and mitigate the transmission losses that will inevitably be incurred as we draw power from Marsh Barton down to Plymouth to charge? They've been taking new circuitry, patenting it, and then and then commercializing it, which is great. So we can help advise on this journey. University has some great patent services, some um, innovation support on level two of the marine building, and we've got great links with Innovate UK for funding. So um, I think you know we're going to be here to help. And low co low carbon transport. There's a recent. Uh, this is my car. I think Plymouth will become a, a sort of low carbon hub um, for transport, whether that's maritime or or on on a on a bike. Um, and you know the recent inauguration of the of the E Voyager, which was a a project um, in collaboration with Team Bridge Propellers and the Impact Lab, which is uh, another another enterprise that's connected to the Plymouth University, and uh, it's the 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 passenger ferry between um, Plymouth and across the Tamar. It's on the back of this Plymouth City Council have promised to install three to 22 kilowatt chargers on the on the Ports Barbican landing side. So it's, you know, it's a, it's going to be, a, transport is going to be a big thing. And there's me cycling from South Brent with my homemade battery. So this is why my, is my personal interest. I use some old laptop cells. Uh, made a made a lithium ion battery, put it in a carry case, and that's the the first ride out there that I, I took on it. So, yeah. So, transport's going to be a big thing too. So, we're interested in anything to do with 
conversion, electronics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, really, it's just a call to action, really, for so the people that are interested in in the power electronics sector. Uh, they're interested in a research collaboration, or they just need advice uh, how to reduce carbon, committed to reducing carbon, looking for funding and being with like-minded professionals. So please fill out your uh, expression of interest form and it'll be great to see you in February. That's what I begin. Thanks very much. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Johnny. Um, that was great. It was awesome to see. You. And um, yeah, thanks for sharing that with us and thank you for being with us, um, even though you haven't started yet. So um, appreciate that. So now we're going to jump into some breakout rooms just to have a, a quick chat with with the industrial research fellows and myself as well. So Haley's just getting those ready. And um, yeah, we're just gonna have a bit of time, a little bit of time and you know, it's only a little bit of time. So we just to introduce and maybe start off some discussions and then we can explore those further in the coming weeks and months. If you'd like to stay in the main room, my colleague Paul Lunt will be in the main room for general inquiries and potentially maybe Emily Reed from the Devon Carbon Plan, if she's, yep, she's still with us. Um, they'll be in the main room if you don't want to go into a breakout room. But um, Haley, are the breakout rooms ready? They are ready and I'm very keen to send everyone off to the rooms uh, to make sure that all works. So good luck everyone, uh, enjoy your breakout rooms. And if you're left in the main room with me, then just let me know which room you wanted to go in. Thanks. Hopefully everyone's received an invitation to join their relevant room. If I've managed to allocate everyone correctly, fingers crossed. <laughs> Anyone who's left in the main room, um, please do let me know which room you wanted to go into. Um, hi, my name's Sam. I had a question for Emily um, about the um, climate emergency plan. Have, had you guys looked into um, carbon capture and negative emissions technologies at all? Um, not in any detail. We've, um, we've the, the plans sort have of come together, as I said, through evidence gathering um, at a local level, but we have obviously been very influenced by um, the recommendations of the Committee on Climate Change. Um, so I think really with, with negative emissions um, and carbon capture and storage, we're, we're mostly influenced by the work that they've done. And we've, we've worked with um, X University Centre for Energy and Environment um, to apportion the national recommendations for to Devon um, as a geography but um, I think the sense in the partnership is mostly that um, they would like to use natural solutions to carbon drawdown so um, sort of peat restoration um, uh, in increasing soil carbon and um, tree planting and things but uh, there is also um, some reference and acknowledgement of carbon capture and storage on, on some key infrastructure. Yeah, because I just I think like if we switched from like green waste energy burning to pyrolysis, we could probably make some like uh, big carbon savings on the emissions and then also um, use the biochar for carbon storage quite effectively. Um, yeah, biochar did come up in some of the um, public submissions. We haven't really got into it hasn't. Um, materialized into a specific action around biochar um so i mean what i would um ask that you could do is perhaps to review the actions that we've got yeah. um and then if you feel like okay no that bit's still missing mm -hmm. then um do respond and say i think this uh, is an omission that needs to be in there yeah okay um I know that there's like some research that needs to be done on like um, on the use of biochar for carbon storage and whatnot. Do you know um, who would be or what would be the best research centre? 
Um, are you talking about it as, as say, like a soil amendment to increase soil carbon, uh, or? or as a construction material? Okay, construction material. I, um, I'm not really sure. Maybe one of the industrial research fellows here. Uh, can I, can I add into that, that Emily? Room? Yeah, sorry. Do. Just sorry. I, I, apologies, talking across you. Sorry, Sam. Sam, um, I'm from Plymouth University. I run the AgriTech project, which is heavily involved in the um, soil carbon stuff that we're doing down in Cornwall. We're doing a massive amount within soil carbons, not only looking at biochars, but looking at a whole load of different amends, including seaweeds as well, and a load of green waste. We're actually fabricating soils with the main aim to actually um, store carbon and to use waste construction materials. So we're working alongside Claire and the Environment Agency really, really closely. So there isn't very many other centres that are doing this, if I'm honest with you, because we're a, legally you can't. Um, so we're having to do it within the university waste parameters at the moment. But more than happy to talk to you about that because that's a major um, project for Cornwall specifically. I'm hoping, Emily, we can talk about that potentially for Devon Definitely. in the future. But it's um, massive. We've got about four or five at the moment looking at soil carbon um, in Cornwall. Sorry. Okay, cool. Yeah, so just to give an intro to what we do, um, I, we make reef cubes, which are basically uh, low carbon concrete artificial reef units, which we want to replace um, like existing engineering units in the marine environment. So they have like a nature inclusive design um, with void, void spaces in them. Um, we're, we're making a switch to like as low carbon concrete as we possibly ca uh, can. Um, at the moment, we're like 10% of the normal carbon footprint, but mm -hmm. Um, we're trying to get it to carbon neutral. So the ability to be able to incorporate negative emissions materials into there to, to even out that balance would be really important for us. Um, okay. So, yeah. If, if you're in a marine environment, Sam, does that mean that you can't use the likes of um, cob or soil? There's a cobage project that we're doing here again within the university that is looking at replacing... Um, um, bricks, concrete bricks with um, inert soils. So what comes underneath the, what we would use for fab soil and we're manufacturing those again here and testing them for um, okay. heat, um, heat blockages. Paul, you probably know more about that than I do, um, but it's mainly to meet building part L of the regulations. And again, that's happening in Brunel. Right, okay. So you're using the soil as a building material. We're using inert soil uh soil soil is a big um we're not using the soil that could be used as a growing material there's no point in using that within the but we're using the waste um clays and stuff like that as well that again come out of um uh mining essentially yeah. okay right yeah well that's really interesting actually because that could be a potential um material source for our concrete let me send you the link in, in chat um unfortunately steve who's part of the project steve goodhue he's not here today um, but he is part of the of, of the low carbon project and i'm pretty sure he'd be quite happy to talk to you about that so have you been working with or do you know the work of um louise firth dr louise firth who, who looks at um, the kind of bioengineering and um sean comber who who in terms of the makeup of the concretes have been looking at leach material to see whether there are impacts on, on marine um, sessile organisms in particular. So they've had done a bit of work on that. Yeah, I'm aware of Louise Firth's research, um, follow it quite closely. And um, I've uh, met Louise a couple of times. We produced a couple of her bio blocks for her, the ones that are at Teeks Hill. Um, Wait, what? What's that? What was the name of the other researcher that was looking at leaching, sorry? Uh, Sean Comber, so they had a, um, Louise and Sean had a paper a few years ago looking at, um, at uh, kind of leaching from concrete and whether there was an effect depending on the mix of concrete on the, on um, sessile organisms in particular and uh, yeah. yeah so that was something that the one. yeah so we've got some leaching tests that we get done by a third party and um, we've got some similar research going on at the moment which is comparing our We've, we made a bunch of reef cubes out of normal concrete and then concrete with a, an admixture, which is what is commonly used for artificial reefs, and then our new mixture. Um, and we're looking at the, uh, 
yeah, the Sestile Fauna on it at the moment. We've got um, 36 cubes in our labs that my um, colleague is analyzing and identifying all the creatures on at the moment. So it's pretty in depth. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's, so that's another aspect of the design that's quite complicated is trying to make it as good as possible for the, the biodiversity. But yeah, we're trying to drive down the, the, the carbon as much as possible as well. Yeah, it's good. Mm. Uh, interesting work. I'm just looking at um, Delphine. I, I wondered if um, you were in the right place or if you had got any questions. Hello. Um, I, I, I'm sure I'm in. I, I'm not sure I'm in the right place. I'm not with an organisation. I'm retired. I'm just an, a, an activist uh, locally with the environment, uh, and I, I'm just really interested to see what what's happening on the ground i've got to i mean in you know i'm i'm, I'm a retired person so uh, uh my my interest is in in in, in you know percolating the knowledge out to the groups that I'm involved with as well um but i'm really interested to hear about the e-bikes uh, you know the the the, the johnny 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 Bloor who's doing power electronics and and is talking about e-bikes um and uh the green walls are just you know I just love the green walls. I just, I think, I think the university with all its flat roofs should be having green, green roofs and green walls everywhere. You know, yeah. why aren't they? It's something <laughs> we're looking yeah, at. The sustainable uh, university of Plymouth. Yeah, it's something we're looking at, and we're ho hopefully it'll be the the first of um, several in our our redevelopment program. But we've got to get some um, now that we've got one that we can point to at least, and uh, uh, then we're hoping to kind of for, for future refits. Um, get a few more on buildings including roofs fantastic so, yeah but well, we'll, kind of, we'll work with anybody too soon. yeah we'll work with anybody to, uh, within plymouth to um, to help sure. um, but what i was going to ask also is what what is what is the relationship with with plymouth city council it's come through devon county council who i believe are making a lot more effort practically to timetable uh, changing to carb to low carbon uh, and uh, my experience with Plymouth Council uh, is that, that, there's, there's, that, that they are waiting for you to do something. <laughs> is, 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 this, is this the way it looks? Sorry, was the, was the question um, is Plymouth... The question is what's your involvement with Plymouth City Council? As I understand it, they're waiting to follow Devon County Council in terms of their low carbon, um, you know, uh, uh, timetable. Um, response to the climate emergency. My, they, they are one of the partners. Um, my impression is that they deserve uh, more credit than that. They're, they seem to be pushing ahead with their own plans um, very ambitiously and um, and uh, engaging with us, but um, also sort of not just waiting for our plan, but um, very actively looking at their own plan as well and collaborating with other partners in, in Plymouth. So um, I think collectively, obviously there's things that they, they need support of outside of Plymouth to feed into that, but I think collectively it's looking quite strong. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I... I um, is, Paul, is, do you am, have I, am I asking in the right place to, to ask what your opinion is on their, their, their plans, their, their practice and their plans around food waste? Just collecting food waste within the city and uh, you know responsibly recycling or using or what um to be honest i i don't know an, enough about their particular plans going forward okay. um yeah. but i would i would imagine that they are um looking to improve that the, the general uh, thrust across devon is to um to better align services uh, and to um you know, increase um, capture, but it, there's there's different logistical challenges in different places. Yeah, it's something un understand understandably, um, and I, I I hear what you're saying. It's just that it Plymouth does seem to have a, a history of of resolutely not a, not not going there with food waste and food collection. It's so, something that, that at the university you're probably aware of this that we're we're in um, collaborating with Jackie and Penny. From environment yeah, yeah. and, and, uh, and our, my students in particular are, are launching a petition at, at the moment. Uh, Fantastic. The, Where is it the, circulating? Uh, Can I sign well, it? <laughs> yeah, it'll be, um, it's going to be through the, uh, and you, so it's through the Students' Union because we're looking okay. at basically getting student feeling about um, the lack of um, waste separation in, in halls. 
And then yeah. hopefully once we've got that, uh, depending on what the outcomes of that, if the students feel as strongly as I think that we feel they do from, from, yeah. the, um, from the discussions we've had with them over the years, that yeah. we will hopefully go back to Plymouth City Council and see if we can work with them to get the waste collected and, and, um, and Langage um, AD plant and Gary at AD plant. So, so that's hi, there's Jackie. So Jackie's really already aware of all of this work. But yes, no, it's exciting. And hopefully we'll get there. We'll get it over the line this time. We've been talking about it for yeah. years. Um, well, it would be great if it came, if, if, if the, the students are finally able to manage the breakthrough. I have to say that um, in my experience, it was the, it was the, the, the Friday's youth uh, student, school children turning up outside um, the, uh, the, the, the civic centre that uh, actually uh, brought on the, in the Plymouth City Council to vote unanimously for their climate emergency um, status. Uh, so if the youth in the university come out and, you know, and, and put their weight to it, then I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. Um, yeah. If I can be involved. Yeah. Yeah. If, if there's a petition, I'll sign it. <laughs> well, we'll keep, we'll keep you. We're looking at launching it in January. So the, uh, I, I read the fact, what I think is the final version. We've got a questionnaire as well, a very simple questionnaire to gather that information. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have some data hopefully in the new year. Okay. Okay, well, that, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good. Thank you. That, that's my contribution. <laughs> just to ask the questions. I'm, I'm just looking, we've got a few new folks just arrived, whether you've came, come out of the breakout rooms or, or um, if you've got any questions for, um, for myself or, or Emily, fire, fire away. I just wanted to say, um... Thank you, Emily, for that lovely presentation of Low Carbon Devon. And yes, please, Mim, we have the slides. Um, so both Jane and I are here from Sustainable South Brent. We're trustees and we've got several projects running um, and low carbon and uh, increased biodiversity are really clear aims of that organisation. So I feel quite excited about this um, opportunity. I'd love to be able to present your PowerPoint to the rest of the trustees. There's such a, an impressive range of um, organizations linking into that project, your first slide especially. So it would be lovely to have that and to think about how we might collaborate in some way. Great, Th yeah, thank you. Um, I, th I believe Haley's gonna circulate the slides, is that right, Haley? Yes, yeah, we'll collate all of the presentations and send them around round to everyone along with them um, with an event feedback questionnaire which I'd really appreciate it if people okay brilliant thank you and I would say one of the one of the things that I would really welcome um, sustainable South Brent doing um, is um, is responding to the consultation particularly because as part of the consultation um, some of the questions are about um, what are you already doing um, that contributes to um, fulfilling these actions? And also, um, what do you think of our proposed governance structure going forward? Uh, and would you like to nominate an organisation um, that ought to be involved in that governance structure? Um, so um, we're sort of gathering up people that might want to be involved in the governance going on. And it may be, we, we can't guarantee that everyone who wants to be will be, but it may be that Sustainable South Brent um, could sit on one of the um, the governance bodies going forward. So do, do Great, respond thank you. to that. That sounds very interesting. Thanks very much, Emma. Thank you. Right, so it looks like everyone's um, coming back from their breakout room. So I hope that was a useful time for you all and some interesting conversations to be had. We could be talking all day um, if the main room is anything to go by. So I think Chris, once he's back, will be summarising the event for us all. And uh, if anyone can spot him, Chris, we're, uh, we'll wait for you to share your screen once more. Yeah, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, apologies for just running over a little bit. So if, if you need to head off, then please do that. Um, just wanted to sum up and just say thank you for coming. It's been really great. I mean, we're really excited about this project and to, to sort of launch this aspect of the project. So do get in touch with us if you've got some ideas 
um, we're really excited to be here and to sort of be exploring how we can put sort of Devon at the, the forefront of positive change. So yeah, really do get in touch with us. We have a, uh, we're involved in another series of events called Future Plymouth 2030, uh, which is a series of ongoing events, the next one being next week. So do check out that. That's around the built environment. And, and we're, we're collaborating with Reba Plymouth for that. So our ethos of the project is very much centered on collaboration. Um, and that's just one example. Um, but I just wanted to leave you really with just, just to reflect on, you know, what is your next step? And how can we help you be part of a low carbon Devon? So just have a think about that over the next few days. And I'm sure there's lots that have come up today. And we're really here to try and support um, a more sort of positive and thriving future for Devon, but a future which starts today. Um, so yeah, we're here and we're, we're very excited to be here. So do get in touch with us and I really look forward to, to chatting with you soon and making those connections. So yeah, appreciate your time today and we'll hopefully <coughs> speak to you soon. So yeah, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you.